Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope that you're doing well whenever and wherever on the globe you happen to be when you're hearing this recording. I hope that you are also welcoming progress and change in the world, in your countries, and in your personal lives. Something cool happened. I think it's cool anyway. The uh, old Wild West law in the state of California of 1872, the Posse Comitatus Law, has finally been, well, revoked. (laughs) You don't have to legally help the police round up or the sheriff (laughs) or any of the long arms of the law, you do not have to any longer help them catch criminals. Yeah, 150 year old law that stated if if you are 18 years old and able-bodied, you do not have the right to refuse to help a police officer round up the criminals. It's one of those old, old, wild west laws back from the days of the cowboys. (laughs) And it was still on the books. And the governor of California started the process on January 30th to get that law off the books. And, well, he did it. He did it. And I, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, these days it's dangerous, and there's always backup. There's a lot of police. There's cars. But back in 1872, everyone rode around on horses. And when someone escaped or they were starting to um, create, you know, like, a, you know, say they were going to rob a bank and, and it started to get underway, it was your duty to help stop it. And if a police officer or sheriff or whatever asked you, you had to go and put your own life on the line without formal training. They didn't have a police academy in 1872. But everybody is willing to pitch in and help. And I do love that that happened back 150 years ago. But now you need more training. You need, you know, you just people usually aren't running around with guns, (laughs) you know, ready and and armed and trained. But in 1872, every little boy got his first rifle around the age of 10 to 12. Some of them even got to have pistols when they're older, you know, but back in the day, I guess if you're on the dirt road and the rattlesnake comes across your path and it's freaking out your horse, you got to shoot it, right? Everybody back in the day had a gun or a rifle or both. And everyone was responsible for the most part, except for the bank robbers, of course. But yeah, the Posse Comitatus Law of 1872 is no longer on the books in the state of California. And that's progress, my friends. <laughs> I I just had to tell you guys that I just thought that I got a big, big kick out of that. And since when is the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, I've been out of the loop too long. I thought it was rainbow. I thought he was her moonbeam. (laughs) Moonbeam. That's what they called our last governor (laughs) and who I loved dearly. And I don't even know what happened. Was it an election? Is he still alive? I don't know. I'm really out of the loop. I barely know who the president is in the country I live in, but hey, <laughs> it's it's kind of nice to get away from the news, you guys. I will be quite frank about that. I'm I'm happy I'm living in Ecuador, and I don't really pay attention to the news, or I only pay attention to what I want to pay attention to. And it's kind of freeing. I also don't get mail. That's also freeing. I don't get a whole lot of phone calls either, and that's also freeing. Last night, a good friend called me, and we talked for about two hours, and my my show was going to be put out there about 9 o'clock my time, but 
He called me and things got pushed back. <laughs> I started the show around 9 and ended around 11 and I didn't get it out until about 2 a.m. here, which was on time. And tonight I'm not on time, so I'm apologizing for that. It took me an hour to get my computer to work and I already recorded what I'm going to do tonight first because I knew it was going to be a long one. I wanted to know how much time I have for my intro. And uh, I spent some a couple hours quality time with my kid tonight too, so that's okay. And um, but but I got I was getting ready to do the intro and my computer was freezing up and it took me like an hour to get it all back online. <laughs> Uh, what did I say? The magnetosphere has been messing with us, messing with electronics, all electronic devices. I don't know. It's been it's been kind of crazy. All right. Well, this is where we're at. Ascension symptoms scale today ninety six. So it hasn't been too bad. My ears have been ringing like crazy in a higher pitch than normal. I saw a lot of blue energy in the sky today, but a lot of gold and sunlight low, low, low on the land. Normally, the sunlight is in the sky, so this was very weird. It was like a cloud cover, and the way it covered the sky only let sunlight in on the lower half of the sky. I've never seen that before. It was really beautiful. During a reading, I was doing a reading for somebody, and it just... That's what happened. Very weird. But I loved it. I don't know. I felt a different, calming, peaceful energy today. And I don't know. I think it's the keto diet. I have been sleeping like a rock. Just absolutely comfortable. Waking up without pain. Every couple days, I make sure I take apple cider vinegar and water before I fall asleep. And my digestion has been great. I'm feeling good. Feeling solid and strong and good. And I think if at all you have any problems in your body, check out the intermittent fasting and keto. Uh, Go look up Dr. Berg Keto, K-E-T-O. It's uh, it's pretty incredible. I mean, I feel good after all this time. But today was my... (laughs) Last week I did not have a cheat day, but the week before I did. And, well, today was a cheat day. My kid talked to me into it. He's like, I'm going to go buy you a piece of cake. And I'm like, what? So he went to the store and he found some carrot cake with cream cheese frosting. He brings it home and the outer frosting was marshmallow. I'm like, what the heck? Not the best piece of cake I've ever had. (laughs) I'm like, how come the inner frosting is not matching the outer frosting? It's all supposed to be cream cheese. And I told my kid, I go, you know what? He craves desserts a lot. I'm going to start making sugar-free, keto-friendly desserts for both of us. Then we could eat dessert every day. (laughs) Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. Yeah, let us eat cake every day. Make it with almond flour, then it's healthy. (laughs) And stevia. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, so we're at 96 on the Ascension Symptom Scale. And um, let's see here. I'm going to read to you from... The Schumann Resonance News. All right. The 10 o'clock a.m. report states, The activity continued uninterrupted even today. The most significant part up to now has started at 7 a.m. UTC time and has led to a peak at 40 hertz just before 8 UTC. And then the 1700 evening report says, Another spike at 27 hertz occurred during a short period of activity lasted from one one hour from 11 UTC. All right, cool. So there we go, 40 hertz in Italy. Now we're going to go over to the Heart Math Institute, see what they have to say for themselves. All right. um, So, all right. Okay. California saw um, a hertz frequency in the Schumann resonance scale of 154. 154 hertz at at, uh, midnight this morning and at 4 a.m. they were at 147 hertz frequency that's pretty pretty darn significant uh in Hofuf Saudi Arabia they started off at 159 at midnight 
on, on the Schumann resonance scale. And by 4 a.m., they were 158 hertz frequency. And um, Lithuania started off at 27 hertz frequency. And at midnight and at 4 a.m., they were at zero. Zero. And Alberta, Canada, always the winner. <laughs> 200, 245 hertz frequency on the Schumann resonance scale, going down to 229 at 4 a.m. And at midnight in Northland, New Zealand, they started off at 117 hertz frequency. And by 4 a.m., they were eh, just at 118. And again with Halului, absolutely zeroed out all the way across. 4 a.m., Lithuania and South Africa were at zero. Uh, I don't know, man. It's it's pretty interesting. Go to heartmath.org. You could see these numbers for yourself. See what you could see. Make out what you think you can make out from it. I don't know what to say about it. Lesson 87 in A Course in Miracles from the Foundation of Inner Peace is a review. We're still doing the review. We have a couple more reviews. The first idea for today to raise our vibrations is this. I will there be light. I will there be light. I will use the power of my will today. It is not my will to grope about in the darkness, fearful of the shadows and afraid of things unseen and unreal light shall be my guide today I will follow it where it leads me and I will look only on what it shows me this day I will experience the peace of true perception I will there be light second idea for today is there is no will but God's There is no will but God's. I am safe today because there is no will but God's. I can become afraid only when I believe there is another will. I try to attack only when I'm afraid and when I try to attack, can I believe that my eternal safety is threatened. Today I will recognize that all of this has not occurred. I am safe because there is no will but God's. There you go. There you have it. That is our lesson (laughs) in A Course in Miracles, ACIM.org. Or you could just go ahead and download an app. There's many different apps uh, from this uh, A Course in Miracles uh, book. Foundation for Inner Peace is the authorized publisher, and it is in the public domain, so it's pretty cool. I mean, it's free. You can get an app. If you um, have problems seeing, you can actually get an app. They'll read it to you, read all the lessons to you. It's pretty neat. All right, guys, um, I'm not going to go very much farther in the introduction because what's coming up tonight is a special night. It's um, I was going to do this with my son. But he um, he backed out because he just he wasn't comfortable doing this tonight. He wasn't sure he was uh, good enough in this topic, even though he has studied relationships quite a bit. He has just done a lot of independent study on what does it take to make a great relationship. And for the first time in his young life, he is in a relationship and. They have an anniversary tomorrow, which I believe is six months. I mean, when you're 16, that's huge, right? That's a milestone, actually. It's half a year. And uh, they're getting serious, and they really love each other. And and when they have a problem, they talk it out. And I was just watching his example and how he's really, like, even though he's 16, he's having an adult relationship, and I'm very proud of that that he's able to keep it together and when there's an issue he talks it out with me or he does more research and he tries to have the greatest amount of emotional intelligence 
as he possibly can. You know, but he was too shy. He's like, I'm not going to do it. And I decided, you know what, this is, this is a worthy topic. Whether you're single, whether you're looking for a soulmate or a twin flame, or um, you are already in a relationship, whether it's new or you're a year or two in, or whether you've been married 10 years, I am hoping that whatever the case, whatever your relationship status is, as of this moment that you listen to this, I hope that the information I set forth for you this evening actually helps you. If you're single, maybe you can look back on your former relationships and go, oh, wow, yeah, that's right. That's why that didn't work out. (laughs) And if you're in a marriage, maybe there's a couple areas you need to work on a little bit. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with working on your relationship. There's no shame in getting help or you know, working on it and improving. No matter what it is you do in your life, you should want to improve it, right? That's what I believe anyway. And so without further ado, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, you're going to hear all about what makes a great relationship right after this, guys. Do you ever wish you could look into the next chapter in your book of life and see what's coming next? What does the universe have in store for you? I can help you with that. I will give you a Celtic cross reading, which is 10 cards, or you can ask me three questions and I use three cards per question. So that's nine cards, or I can channel your higher guidance, or maybe God directly for you. Maybe you want to talk to your dear departed Aunt Edna, because maybe you have a few questions and she was the smartest person you knew. If your deceased relatives are available or your ascended masters, I can channel them for you personally. Let me have one hour to show you the future in your next chapter of your book of life. Readings are $75 and it takes me an hour to an hour and a half to complete. And for this price, you will also be hooked up to the healing grid around the planet for free, which means yours truly, me, I will be giving you Reiki 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. All you have to do is let me know, metaphysicalsoulspeak at gmail.com, and we will explore your future together. If you're listening to this, you obviously like podcasts and you probably like music too. Long walks on the beach, romantic dancing under the stars. And oh, wait, we're not doing that right now (laughs) on Spotify. You can listen to all of that in one place for free. And you don't even need a premium account, which is cool. Free is always good. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, including your long romantic walks on the beach. Also, one one thing I love about Spotify is that you can easily share what you're listening to with your friends via Spotify's integrations with the social platforms like Instagram. So that makes it really, really versatile. Just search for Metaphysical Soul Speak on the Spotify app or browse podcasts in 
the Your Library tab. And follow me, of course, don't forget, so that you'll never again miss an episode of Metaphysical Soul Speak. Spotify is the world's leading music streaming service, and now it can be your go-to for podcasts, too. Thank you guys so much for supporting Metaphysical Soul Speak on Spotify. All right, guys, tonight we're talking about what makes a great relationship. And I'm not talking about in the beginning when you're just meeting each other and you're starting the dating process. I'm talking about after you've decided, you've discovered this person you want to commit with. They're not a psychopath. They're not a narcissist. They're not a sociopath. They, you've like done all of your screening. You've checked all the boxes as far as your boundaries are concerned, and they've never crossed a one. Like they didn't say, I love you too soon. And they didn't start laying all the heavy stuff on you in the beginning. You know, everything went smoothly. Now say it's you know six months or more into the relationship and you're beginning to start a relationship. What does it take to make a great relationship? Now I'm also referring to people who are single and not in a relationship yet. This is stuff to keep in mind. And if you've been married 10 years or five years or 20 years, maybe this is a refresher course. Maybe you can look at your relationship with the, with the mirror and, and hold the mirror up to it. And see if there's a little fog on the mirror. Is your, is your marriage still breathing? <laughs> is it still alive? Does it still have a pulse? Maybe, maybe everything on this list except two or three things aren't really kind of working. And that's okay. Working on a relationship together mutually is okay. It actually strengthens your bonds, right? So we're going to go over some of the finer points of what does it take to make a great relationship. I think when your word is your bond, integrity, number one, integrity is number one. You must have integrity. If you tell your beloved that you're going to be there at seven o'clock, you're already late at seven Oh one. You're already late. You've already broken your word. It's always better to say, I'm going to try to be there. I'll be there between 6.30 and 7.30. Is that okay? And then you show up at 6.25. What a surprise. You're early. Wow. Punctual. You're more than punctual. You're better. You know? <laughs> and that's integrity. But if you say you're definitely going to be there and you're not, it's like that is the opposite of a trust-building exercise. That is a, an exercise in... in um, showing the person that you're not serious about them. You're not serious in keeping your word. What else are you not going to be serious about? What else can you not be trusted in? You see how deep this can go, right? So the number one thing is integrity. Your word is your bond, but chances are, if you've gotten into a relationship, you probably passed that initial test, right? You know, you say you're going to get together on Saturday and then three Saturdays roll around before they call you again Where's the integrity in that? You know, um, if you've uh, been dating for six months and they know your birthday's coming up and suddenly they ghost on you and they tell you like a week later, oh, I'm sorry, I missed your birthday. It's like, really? You know, that's there's no integrity there. <laughs> you, you know, so you have to look at all the factors as far as integrity, not just what they say, but what they do. And you have to look at yourself as well, not just what you say, but also your actions and what you do. So integrity is, is number one. Number two I have on my list. I have a pretty huge list, so we have a lot to get through. Transparency. When you're getting into a serious, serious committed relationship where marriage is in the sight line, <laughs> Maybe not the words I should say right now, but but you you know it's on the horizon. It's coming. You have already spoken of it. You're pretty certain it's 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 definitely going to happen. You're both on board. Marriage is going to happen. Or if you're already in a marriage, 
transparency, financials. You know, you have to know everything, right? Uh, is the person um, claiming to be very wealthy and you don't see their portfolio? You don't know? Like maybe they're trying to puff themselves up, but they're really in debt. You have to have transparency. You know, is the person going to use you because you're wealthy? It's possible. It's possible. Hopefully you have um, filtered out <laughs> the possibility of that in the beginning dating stage. That's why you should never rush into a relationship. Never. You should go slow. You should see the integrity and character. The person has to have moral values and ethics and character. That's all part of integrity, right? And transparency is part of this too. Like, you know, you have to be very honest about your financials. You know, hey, if you only make $24,000 a year, but you're honest about it, that's better than somebody that doesn't have a job and they're collecting unemployment and they're saying that they make a hundred grand a year and they're really truly living on like, say, credit cards or they say they have a job and you find out later they're a Coke dealer. And, you know, if you get married and to someone like that, you know, it might be a fun and exciting lifestyle for a while, but what happens down the line if you have kids and a mortgage and everything and then they, they go to jail and the government freezes your assets? You could lose your kids because, you know what I mean? So you have to be, I mean, that's not like a common scenario, but it's a possibility. You have to know how much money there is and where it's coming from. And you have to know how consistent it's been. Like if someone makes $100,000 in a year and you're like, oh, good, a good, strong, solid partner with which to have a real great relationship partnership with and then you find out well that's their sixth job in the last seven months it's like wait a minute wait there's something wrong right you got to find out so financials how long you know I have a um an aunt who worked for an investment banking firm and <laughs> how she met my uncle was that she kept everybody's financial files and she wanted to see who was consistent because she wanted to be with someone who was a good provider, but also someone who's not going to be picking at her bones when push comes to shove, you know, she wanted to make sure that she has her own money, but they also have their own. And she wanted to make sure she was with someone who's going to be strong and solid and consistent over the years. Okay. She kept my uncle's file in the drawer and she had two other men's files in the drawer. And they were all interested in her and she all kind of, she kind of just flirted with them, but put them off. And the one that had the, he, she, he had the right amount of money where he could provide and she wasn't going to be picked clean later, you know, <laughs> cause she's like, I had my own money too. And I could have lived forever, you know, on my own, but I really wanted a good relationship with a good man. And the most consistent man was my uncle. And when she made her, her uh, mind known to him, they started dating. And one day he just showed up and he said, so, um, uh, he says, I'm, I'm not working. You know, he was like consulting in another state where she was. And he says, I'm not coming back because my job, my contract here is done. <laughs> so I have one more question to ask you. And they'd been dating for like six months. And she's like, what? And he said, so do we call it quits or do I go get a y'all haul and take you to California with me? Are you going to go to California or, or not? And she said, yeah, I'm going. And they've been married ever since. It's been like 20 something years. You know, financials are important. It's important to know. And she, she told me, she's like, I wasn't a gold digger. I mean, I didn't want to be with a poor man, obviously who does. But she said, for me, I already had my own thing. I had my own apartment. I had my whole life and my life was great. But she had been taken up, you know, advantage of in the past. She didn't want to be in that situation again. I've been taken advantage of by guys in the past. I'll never give money to a man again. You know, when a man asks me for money, even if it's 20 bucks, I'm like, dude, if you can't provide $20 for yourself, you're not the right man for me. You know what I mean? It's like kind of ridiculous, you know? And the last guy that I dated um, here in Ecuador, he was an American, but we were dating for like six months and he was a millionaire 
and it was lovely. I mean, every single time I like reached my wallet, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to pay Let's be equal partners, you know, in this meal or whatever. And he's like, no, I'm the man. I'm going to pay for you. It's like, okay, if you want to be old fashioned, traditional, but just so you know, I'm willing to be a, a equal partner in all things with you, you know, and cause I like that transparency. And I told him, he knew how much money I made. And he's like, I know you make your money, but you save your money. Okay, fine. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to be with the money. You don't have to be an equal partner. You can be old fashioned or traditional or completely non-traditional. A lot of women like having the power financially in the relationship and they like to have, you know, the man, um, or they're okay with the man not being on equal footing. And as long as you're both okay with it in the beginning, then that's okay. You know, but you don't want to find out that person was poor all along and lying or if they're super wealthy and they didn't trust you. You know, I mean, even though I've seen that scenario go correctly (laughs) and I've also seen it go, well, kind of terribly wrong. If you're not honest with me from the beginning, I don't give a crap how much money you have. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to not going to go for it because how you do anything is how you do everything. What if, you know, if you're going to lie to me about something so basic as where you're at financially, I I, I have no choice but to say I, I don't want to be with someone who's going to be going behind my back, lying, cheating about anything, right? So financials, that's important. But also transparency is about familial relationships, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Right? So transparency as far as, you know, do you get along with your mom? Do you get along with your dad? And if not, why not? And if you didn't have a mom or dad growing up, did you have an adult in your life while you were a child that gave you a proper role model? You know, my my kids haven't had a proper father because their father died. And I tried to date a few men and they were all narcissists because I did not know. And now I just haven't been dating. I haven't dated like for real anyone very seriously, except this guy last year for a few months. And that wasn't even a hundred percent serious because you know, other things, his financials were great. We were very equal in the way we thought of a lot of things, but he wanted kids. I can't do kids again, you know? So sometimes it falls apart just because of that, (laughs) you know, but he wasn't the one I knew he wasn't the one. You know, it's like when you meet someone, you kind of hope they're the one and then you find out, no, they're definitely not the one. Ah, darn it. Back to the old drawing board. But if you are in a relationship, you still got to look at this stuff. You know, one reason why I was never going to work out with him, he hated his mother. Someone hates their mother. What, how, you know, are they going to be secretly hating me because I'm a woman also? What is he associating with me? Why is he attracted to me? Maybe I remind him of parts of his mom that he liked. But then when push comes to shove, is he going to treat me as bad as he treats his own mother? It's very possible, right? So um, as far as uh, the next thing is honesty, you have to be very, very honest. And you have to be honest about your goals, your habits. And that can be, I mean, that's a hard conversation in the beginning. And what if you've been in a marriage for five, six years, and then there's some things you start doing that aren't so honest because you haven't been honest about what you're doing. What if you've developed drug habits? What if you have started to drink or you started to gamble and you've gambled the family's money away? Happened to a girlfriend of mine. She had inherited $100,000 and she was a firefighter and so was he. And her husband died and left her $100,000. Then her mother died, left her another $100,000. And they were like, well, let's move to California. And her her new husband ended up... um, he had a, he got a job. He became in time a tenured professor at Cal Arts. And he had a secret drinking problem. And then he started making investments with her mother's inheritance money. And one day she went to get money out to pay for a vacation. And there was no money gone. All the money was gone. And they'd been together 10 years. And it blew up the whole everything. And they had a child together. You know, it's just, you got to be honest about everything. You know, if you, if you start gambling, you have a problem. You've got to admit it right away. 
You gotta, you gotta put, put a plug in that boat before you sink the family ship. But drugs, drinking, sex. Now, what if you have a habit where you are interested in B and D or S and M, and you never told your partner, and now you're seeing a mistress, whether you're man or woman, you're, you're going to see somebody, and you're doing these sexual acts, even if it's not sex, but that's still a sexual part of you, and you're not sharing, you're not being honest. And they find out about that's going to blow up the relationship. You got to sit down, even if you have to go to a counselor and do it with a mediator. You've got to be honest about who you are to the core of who you are, right? You've got to be completely transparent about who you are to yourself as well as to that person. So, you know, next thing is trust. Trust is something that builds up over time. It can take a year to build up trust and it could take one damn day to break it and you have to start all over or the marriage is over or the relationship is over right so trust is a big one like that's a huge reason you know like lacking of in trust or breaking trust is a huge reason why divorces and breakups happen don't break the trust your word is your bond integrity it all goes back to that so what else makes a great relationship beyond those things, right? <laughs> Mutual interests in common. You have to be able to do something together, not just sex. Sex is awesome and well and good, but you have to be able to have a conversation when it's over. You know, you have to be able to enjoy other things together, you know? Like if one of you is a, a straight up vegan and the other one enjoys eating ice cream, is that going to work out? Maybe it's okay to have uh, separate interests in common. It's okay. But if you have, um, you know, say you go bowling together, you're in, you join a bowling league for fun. Maybe you start off as an ironic bowling couple and then you end up loving it and, you, and, you, and you're going, yeah, that's cool. Maybe you want to go horseback riding together or go to the park every, every Saturday in the fall and fly a kite. Whatever it is that you do together, you have to have your mutual interests in common say you uh, you both like camping or you like glamping <laughs> or you want to go to Burning Man every year and that's your thing let's go do psychedelics in the desert and get wild and crazy for one weekend every year and the rest of the year we go back and we're investment bankers in the city or we're lawyers or doctors or whatever you know <laughs> that's okay having mutual interests is awesome but also it's healthy to have separate interests the, the things you don't have in common, you know, if you're, um, maybe you're a football widow <laughs> and your and your honey wants to watch the, the game and you're like, Oh my God, I just don't want to watch jocks. This is ridiculous. You know, or maybe it's the opposite. <laughs> maybe you're the one that's a sports fan yelling your head off at the TV and your and your husband's like, dude, no, or your wife or whatever. Again, this is not uh, heteronormative or cisgendered. I'm not meaning it to be, but you know, just for anyone. So say your, your, your partner loves sports and you don't, that's okay. Let them have their time with their friends where they watch their sports and you find something to do during that time. Then when you have mutual interests apart, that gives you a chance to build up trust. It gives you a chance to, um, fulfill who you are inside because you are a separate entity. You're not one unit. Even though they say that the two become one, it's not true. You're both individuals. You're always going to be individuals first. Born alone, you die alone. Even if you're married, when you die, you still go down that tunnel by yourself, right? So you still have to have some separate things. And that's how you keep your own healthy personal boundaries as well. That's how you stay healthy emotionally. So have your separate interests, you know, and friends. It's okay to have friends outside the relationship, but there's a caveat to that. Do not have friends that are going to try to drive a wedge between you and your sweetheart. If you have friends that try to disparage or down talk the person you're with, you're going to have to think about maybe dumping them as friends, or you can have to think about maybe they're telling the truth and you've got to see what their motivations are, right? But hopefully you're able to develop wonderful, great relationships with friends outside of the marriage or, or relationship. And 
You got to make sure that they're not encouraging you to do things that would push your integrity and your trust with your honey. Basically, you do not want someone to push you to drink when your spouse is an alcoholic and you decided together not to drink. You can't just come home drunk. You know what I mean? So you have to really be uh, aware, you know, having a great relationship. A lot of it is just being super aware. All right. So if you have friends inside the relationship, that's even better. Find another couple and you guys have, maybe I'll go to karaoke night and tie one on every Friday. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's all mutually agreed upon, and it's still, you know, if that's what you do, right? Say you have um, season tickets to the opera and you have another couple friend that love the opera too. And then you could go out to dinner and discuss the opera after. Why not? It's always better to go to the early one. So you have time to sit in a restaurant after. I used to take my kids to the symphony. I was, um, I was paid for the season. And every month we'd go to the symphony, my children and I, and we'd go and... Afterwards, we went to our favorite restaurant. We would hang out. And sometimes it'd be a basketball game, <laughs> Detroit against Chicago. And we had a route for Detroit, of course. You know, so we go from the symphony to be screaming our heads off in this restaurant slash bar, you know, and watch sports like we, you know, with my kids. This was just a way that I developed my relationship with my children, you know. But if you're in a relationship with your sweetheart, your one true love, you know, it's the same thing. You have to come up with those things. But if you have another couple to do stuff with, that's even more fun. You know, that's even more fun. Because then you have four people to have a discussion instead of two. And it makes it a little bit more more exciting. There's more opinions going around. There's more lively conversation. There's more energy. There's more synergy to the night. Especially if you get along with the other couple. You know, so... Let's see here. Uh, where, where, where else was I? Uh, you have to be willing to share the same values of commitment as well. You know, in these other, the other couple has to be willing to say, share this, the same values. So, so for example, say you are a vegan couple, you don't want to go out with meat eaters because you're never going to agree on a restaurant. I mean, that's just basic, right? But beyond that, I mean, you don't want to be like if you're um, super conservative and you're all about the Republican style values, you're not going to want to go out with the tree huggers or vice versa. You know, for me, I'm a bleeding heart liberal type and I love everybody and I want everyone to have an equal shake at life. Right. And I don't really want to hang out with Republicans, to be honest, because they irritate me. And it ends up in arguments and fights. So if you have political um, sameness among, you know, between you and the one you're in love with, as well as the couple you hang out with, it just creates for more peace and harmony, you know? And it's just the way it is. So um, you have to have with your sweetheart to make a great relationship, even if you've been married a long time. You have to have the willingness to commit, to be all in, 100% ride or die. When you commit to a marriage, you can't have a clause to get you out of it. Now, I'm all for prenuptials, especially if one of you is very wealthy and one of you is not. Prenuptials protect both parties. I mean, protecting assets, that's, that's important. You don't have to be married though, by the way. But if you are Christian and it's best in your best interest to be married for the sake of keeping that solidarity with your community, the greater community, your church home or whatever, then it's very important to you. Then it is important to marry. And then I do agree that prenuptials, should be discussed as a business arrangement because marriage is a legal commitment as well as an emotional heartfelt commitment. Okay. So you have to think practically and pragmatically while you're, you know, think with your head as well as your heart when it comes to the logistics of it. 
Um, I mean, if I find out that my twin flame has $200 million in the bank and I have not that, (laughs) um, yeah, I'll sign a prenup in two seconds. I would never put him in a position to think I'm out for his money or that I'm going to sue him for half of what he's worth or whatever. I'm not that kind of person. You know, when I, um, my husband and I divorced, he paid for the house. So guess what? I let him have the house when we left, when we broke up, I could, and it was his idea to break up. I could have easily taken that house. I could have forced him to sell it and taken half the money to buy my own house, but I didn't do it. I refused to do it. You know, I said, Hey, just give me a hundred dollars a month. That's it. That'll be enough to cover, um, you know, like a third of the groceries for the kids. That's it. Just, you know, and that's all I did. I mean, I, you know, I asked for actually I asked for $500 a month, but he, I ended up with 100 <laughs> and then he died. So, you know, and then I ended up with this whole retirement. <laughs> then I ended up with 100%. But anyway, <laughs> whole nother crazy story. But <laughs> um, So, yeah, so you have to, Make sure once you are on the same page in the relationship and, you know, even if you, again, this applies to everybody in whatever stage you're at, once you're on the same page with that person and you know you're on equal footing as far as feelings are concerned, you got to look at the better, bigger picture because love is never enough, right? You have to look at your life goals and your partnership goals. So you have to ask yourself some pretty hard questions. Do we want kids? What if we cannot have kids? What if we really want children? Are we willing to go with all in one of the options? Are you willing to adopt a baby? Are, are, is it going to be a baby inside um, your culture? Or are you willing to go to to Asia or Africa to adopt a baby that would have otherwise been raised in poverty? And if so, are you going to raise that child with the values of the culture with which that child was born? (laughs) What religion are you going to be? One of you is Catholic, one of you is Jewish. Which, Which one are you going to go with? Are you going to honor both faiths in one household? Are you going to raise the children as one faith or both faiths? I mean, these, before you get deep, deep, deep into relationship, you should have already had this conversation because that, that can be a make it or break it. That's a deal breaker for a lot of people. I definitely want kids. I definitely want that kind of life or I definitely do not. You know, a lot of the the men that I've recently, um, kind of talked to about potentially starting something with, it turns out they all wanted kids. And I'm like, I've already got my kids. My kids are grown. I mean, my youngest is 16, but my oldest is grown. He's an adult. He's got his own job. He lives in Berkeley. I mean, in Oakland, you know, I, for me, been there, done that. And I'm not going to raise more little ones. I'm, I'm a career woman now. And I put off everything as far as my career for the sake of my kids for 20 years. I'm done with that. Willing to go for grandkids though. When the grandkids come along, I'm happy. Don't, don't, don't call. You could call me grandma, ma. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> me, ma, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't care if, even if they call me granny, as long as they love me and as long as they're healthy. But you know, for me, I'm just like, I'm waiting. I'm in a whole nother stage of my life. I'm in my, the career stage of my life and I did things backwards. I know, but I'm dyslexic. What can I say? (laughs) So you have to look at the kids and now the career. When you get married, is one of you going to drop the career and become a householder? Or are you both going to work? And and what are your hours? You know, you have to talk about that. Where do you want to live? When you get married, you're going to move to the countryside and have kids. You're going to stay in the city and have a penthouse luxury suite overlooking the harbor or whatever, you know, no matter where you live, of course, you know, if you're living in the European union and you want to, you know, 
continue your career in Germany, but you plan on retiring in Paris, you have to talk about that first. You know, if you live, you know, you live in Bristol and your goal is to eventually live in the countryside in England, then, you know, hey, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to live that near that 14 year old boy who went blind with eating potato chips and ham. <laughs> You know, Bristol's a rough neighborhood. I have a lot of friends from there, actually. People I met on the road, they wanted to get out of Bristol as much as I wanted to get out of the States. I met a lot of people from there, and they're like, oh, it's not a place you want to live. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so you have to figure out where you're going to live now while you're doing your career thing. And if you get pregnant, are you going to stay in the city? Are you going to go to the country? Maybe you want to go have a ranch. What are your life goals? You know, say maybe your, your personal goal was to have your career for six, seven, eight years and then move to the countryside and open up a horse ranch in Montana. You know, or maybe your goal was to move to the Philippines and live an islander lifestyle. You know, those are the kinds of things you got to talk about your, your hopes, your fears, your dreams, your goals, religion, you know, all of that. What, what neighborhood are you going to live in first? Whose? His or hers? His or his? his hers or hers? You know, <laughs> yours or theirs? Whose parents are you going to visit on Sundays? Are you going to visit your parents or your aunties or your grandma? You know, do you want to live near your kids if you're an older adult and you have kids? Are you going to, are you going to be willing to move out of the country? You know, where are you guys going to go on vacation? These are the questions that you have to ask if you want to have a great relationship, right? What is your lifestyle going to be? Are you going to go to the, um, the uh, races and watch the car races every week? That's so fun. I used to go to the races when I was a kid. I loved it. The sprint car races, the stock car races. Oh my God. Oh, I lived for that. I loved that. <laughs> I used to sit as close as possible to the track so I get covered in mud. I loved that. <laughs> in North Dakota, it was so fun. But, you know, it's not what I wanted to do the rest of my life. But for those years, it was fun. You know, but I'm kind of a symphony opera sort of gal. I love that. I like the theater. I like seeing live performances. I love rock concerts, you know? So you have to understand, maybe your honey does not like to go salsa dancing or sing karaoke. Maybe they want to see live theater. Maybe they want to go to cultural experiences, you know? I used to go to every cultural experience I could. I went to... Um, in Santa Barbara, there were weekends where there was like German fest, there was Greek week, there was, you know, where you go and eat Greek food, the Greek festival. I went to all the, the Italian festival. I went to all the festivals in Los Angeles. I went to the African festival and I tasted food from West Africa and, and, you know, Kenya and I mean, I'm all over the place. I was like, oh my God, these cultures are so incredible. And I love to learn, learn about other cultures. Well, what if you have someone who's a xenophobe? <laughs> they want to stay home and eat hot dogs and hamburgers every weekend. You got to know that stuff before you get into the relationship, right? How compatible are you going to be with your lifestyle choices and activities? You know, is one person saying they only want to go camping and one person is saying every year instead of camping, I want to go on a cruise. I want to, I want to be on a cruise ship or I want to go to Paris You know, I want to see the city lights in April. I want to see the rain. You know, Paris and, and it's, there's nothing, no city on earth more beautiful when it rains. From what I understand, I have memories. I've lived in Paris many times in past lives. I've lived in France. I love France a lot, actually. But, um, you know, you got to understand, you know, like one of you wants to go zip lining through the jungle <laughs> and have experiences in the Amazon rainforest. And the other one's like, Oh no, I, I Swiss Alps all the way. I want to go skiing every year. That's my deal. Are you, are you going to be able to do both? And what's your lifestyle going to be like? How much money are you going to save? How much money are you going to have in the bank? Are you going to have a mutual bank account? I suggest you don't. 
I suggest you have two separate bank accounts, but you're very transparent about what you have in those accounts. You know, I'm, I'm all for keeping everything separate financially. I always have been since my first relationship where my husband or my, or my husband, we were, when we were boyfriend and girlfriend living together for almost seven years. So after a couple years, we were common law husband and wife. And he took one day while I was asleep, he went and got every single thing out of my savings because we had a mutual account, but it was all my money I put in there in the savings account that's attached to our checking. And he went ahead and spent it on something frivolous for himself. Very selfish, very, very selfish. And he did not pay me back until the relationship was over. And a couple weeks later, he showed up and gave me $80. And it was still half the money I had saved. You know, it was just, I mean, all my savings. I mean, I was, I was at that time, I made like five bucks an hour. <laughs> I didn't make very much money. It was like four seventy-five an hour plus, plus bonus. I was a salesperson. You know, but usually I made 15 an hour because I was pretty good at what I did. But I was like 19 years old. You know, it was like, God, I was a kid. It was so hard. Like, why would you put me in that position? Why would you do that to me? I mean, it took me so long to save my money <clears throat> after paying bills and stuff, you know? I mean, my life's quite a bit different, thank you God, now. But but what is your lifestyle going to be? And what are your hours, your career, your time together? Are you going to spend 60 hours to 80 hours a week working? Do you put in, are you a lawyer? Do you put in 120 billable hours a week? And you go home and you sleep four hours a day, you know, or are you going to have 80 hours a week together? What if you're both retired? How are you going to spend your time? You know, is your, is your honey, is she going to go off to the golf course and go golfing every single day while you hang out at home waiting? Or what are you going to do? You know, you gotta, you gotta come up with all this. Um, so to have a great relationship, you have to make sure that you have all of these things in place. And if they don't work, how are you going to be able to fix it? I don't like it when you're gone 80 hours a week. Can you cut back? Do we have the money? Right? So you have to understand. And if you have a business together, that's another way to live a lifestyle. What if you decide, let's just be together 10 years and then start a business together. Are you going to bicker all the time? How do you solve arguments? You know, so is one person going to carry the other or is it going to be a 50, 50 percent partnership? Has it been imbalanced until now? Now you've decided that now the kids are grown. You're going back to have a career. You're going back to university and work, and then you're both going to mutually work. Or maybe one carries the other for like four years until that person gets to university and has a career. And then now it's your turn to go to university and have a career. That can happen, but you got to make sure it does happen. Your word is your bond. Remember, going back to the first one on the list, integrity. So, um, let's see. Yeah, the household. Who who has the household responsibilities? Who takes out the trash? Who does the cooking and the dishes? Or do you have someone to do all those things for you? You know, you both work 60 to 80 hours a week. You can afford a maid and a cook, maybe even a driver. What kind of lifestyle are you going to want? You know, when before I had kids, I always thought it would be nice to have a nanny to come and help me with the responsibilities, you know, of the house or of the children kind of work, you know, in tandem together. But then when I finally met my, my husband and we were together, he and I were both home 100% of the time. He was retired and we had money. So it was like, okay. But for a minute, I'm like, I think I need a nanny. I'm exhausted. And I want to try to have a career. And I want, I started writing movie scripts. And I'm like, I want to try to make a go of it. And he agreed to it. And after I had interviewed several nannies and I found somebody that I was going to hire, I really liked her. She was actually, um, had just gotten a visa from South Africa and she was an amazing woman. She was young and she wanted to come and stay with us. I'm like, Oh, it'd be so great for my kids to learn about other cultures. And then he put his foot down and said, no, I don't want anyone living here with us. Are you crazy? 
I'm like, well, why did you say that we could, right? So you have to be able to work that stuff out. I'm like, well, if you had told me from the beginning, no, then I would have known. But so again, that goes back to the honesty and the integrity. You know, you get into it, you have your kids, and then now you don't know if you want a nanny or not. You know, you got to work out this stuff in advance. But if you don't and there's a problem, you have to be able to argue fairly. Well, I'll do another show on that in the future, actually. Who's going to clean the house? Who's going to clear... Um, you know, Who's going to have the clear-cut chores, you know? Is it my week to do trash and your week next week? Do you do every, all jobs equally? You know, with me and my husband, he did the, he took the trash out. And then when he threw his back out, I took the trash out. We, we fought over who did dishes. <laughs> we both wanted to do the dishes for the other one. You go sit down. No, it's my turn. I'm going to do it. <laughs> we fought in the opposite direction. We didn't want to be lazy. We both wanted to do for the other. And we also cooked and we fought about who's going to cook tonight. And it was practically every day for 13 years. Who's going to cook? I was going to cook. No, I'm going to cook. I'd tell him I'm going to cook at 6 o'clock. So at 5 o'clock, he'd start cooking. I'm like, oh, man. You know, I would have cooked you dinner at 4 o'clock, but you didn't tell me. He's like, yeah, I got hungry and the kids looked hungry. <laughs> their, their cheeks were looking sallow. I'm like, they were not looking sallow. They were fine, you know. <laughs> They eat every night at six and suddenly you want to go early. All right, fine. <laughs> so you just have to be able to work it out. You have to take everything in stride because you know what? Even the best laid plans go wrong. And how are you going to handle that? How are they going to handle that? So um, so who's going to take care of the clear-cut chores with your house or apartment, with your life? Uh, with the responsibilities of the children, if there are any. And what if your children are only your plants, your goldfish, or your cats and dogs? Are you going to have fur babies? Is the other one allergic? If you know you have your heart set on owning three cats, <laughs> and your honey is allergic, you got to be able to either make adjustments or it's a deal breaker. I have a friend; she won't give up her animals for anything. She says the animals—that's what keeps my heart going. That's what keeps my that, that, that's what gives my life richness. Doris Day was the same way. God rest her soul. Mm, love that lady, right? So travel. Who's going who's gonna to arrange the vacations? Are you going to have a vacation? How many? Maybe you have one week for you and one week for your honey. You know, so um, who's going who's gonna to choose the family vacation or the couple vacations every year is going to be both of you together or just one of you choosing what we all do. <laughs> or maybe you're going to come up with the best possible plan and then present it to each other like a formal presentation. <laughs> they did that on Modern Family. It was hilarious. <laughs> you know, trying to convince the kids, go to Hawaii, no, go to Australia. <laughs> So are you going to do a uh, couple vacations? Are you going to do separate vacations? Some couples choose to spend one week apart every year. And then it gives them a greater perspective on the relationship and on themselves. and gives them a chance to renew their inner spirit and then come back together and discuss their experiences. There's nothing wrong with wanting to spend time apart once in a while. That's okay. And it's actually emotionally healthy. So at what point, if you're just dating, at what point do you want to get married? I would suggest a minimum of one year knowing each other first. You need to know how they act during holidays. Is it, Do they have a dark day where the rest of the year they're fine? And then say every time April 17th or whatever rolls around, now they're going to be, they disappear and they come back drunk and you don't know what happened. Some people have a dark day. Remember Luke's dark day on the Gilmore Girls? Some people are like that. I have uh, one day a year where I'm, I'm a little upset. Usually it's around August 16th. I don't go out and get drunk and I don't have a dark day. I don't like disappear. I don't go off fishing or anything. <laughs> but it was the day that Elvis Presley died. Broke my heart. Broke my freaking heart when the day Elvis Presley died. Because when I was really young, I when I was like eight years old, I said to my grandma, I want to see Elvis Presley before he dies. 
And she said, oh, Lord, he's he's going to live forever. He's not going to die. Don't worry. When you're 16, you can go. And I go, Grandma, he's going to be dead before I'm 16. He'll be dead by the time I'm 12. And he died the year I was, uh, right before I turned 12. I think it was right before I turned 12. Or, yeah, yeah, I think it was. Or maybe it was right before I turned 11. And I called my grandma and I said, I told you he was going to die. And he was in concert. And you could have brought me. And, and we didn't go. And you loved him, too. And we missed him. And I'm so sad, you know, and it broke my heart. I was madly in love with Elvis Presley, madly in love with him. (laughs) And I was just like, no. (laughs) So for me, that's like kind of my dark day. And it was also the first time I ever had a miscarriage was around that day. So I think it was on that day. And so everyone has a, a day during the year. I have a friend who every year in April, his back goes out because something emotional that he doesn't really remember happened in April that he has repressed. He says since he was a teenager, his back always goes out in the springtime and he can't move for about a week. He says, I don't know what the hell is happening to me, but it happens every year and it's always in April and it really irritates me. You have to know somebody for a whole year to understand um, their good times or bad times or weird times. There are dark days and they're really bright and happy days. (laughs) Um, I'm always happy by the time August 25th rolls around because it's my birthday, you know, and I was always told by my parents how much they loved me and how that was the happiest day of their life, even though they adopted me because they got the phone call that that I was here, I was alive, I was safe. I was in an incubator for, for like a couple weeks. I almost died, but that made them love me all the more. You know, so for me, my birthday is like, yeah. So, you know, I have a a sad day in the beginning of August and a happy day at the end of August. That's okay. But you have to know that about your partner. You got to know that about yourself. And again, transparency. If you know you have a dark day, you can't just disappear randomly. You got to let your your honey know, look, next week's coming up a, a day that I don't like to talk about. It's a day that I'm very sad. My, my stepdad, he has always had the, the day that his, his brother, his older brother died. And um, I met his brother a couple times and I loved him. He was my Uncle Joe and I loved him. And when he, he just had a heart attack in his bar and died one day in Los Angeles. And um, every year after that, um, that day rolled around and my, my stepdad wouldn't even talk. Not one word. He'd go out drinking. He'd come home late. You know, and, and um, it was very sad. And no one ever mentioned it to him because we all knew what it was. That was his best friend, you know, and his older brother was his best friend. And people have the dark days sometimes, right? So is love enough? No, love alone is not enough. Like I said, I love all my exes and I always will. There's a reason why they're in my rear view mirror though. (laughs) And I don't go backwards. And I've been with people where they're on the verge of breaking the relationship, which seems pretty good. And I'm like, look, if you do this thing, I'm never coming back to you. I don't ever go backwards. I don't give second chances because then I'm reminded about why we broke up in the first place. I have one ex that's still pursuing me. Do I love him? Yes. Oh my God, so much. But I don't go backwards. There's a reason why we broke up. There's a reason, and it's not going to ever happen again. My friends, yes. Will I talk at 3 in the morning if, they, if they're if they having a problem and they need me? Oh, hell yeah. But I just, there's a reason I don't go backwards, right? So love is not enough, right? Commitment, love, um, and you have to have mutual common interest in all the stuff we talked about, integrity, trust, and all that, but also respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, baby, tell me what it means to me that person has to allow you to speak to have a voice in the relationship and you need to allow them to speak and have a voice in the relationship mutual beneficial respect and privacy don't go through their phone you go through their phone you go through their drawers you you you're telling them you can't trust them and if it turns out you can't trust them you know did you have integrity and still give them their, their privacy because in the end when all is said and done are you able to say well I trusted them they betrayed me and we broke up but at least I did not betray their trust because you have to have integrity in everything that you do 
you know, and you have to expect if they're going to go through your phone, are you going to do the same? I don't think you, and if you are the kind of couple where you're into each other's business like that, that can lead to some serious issues. You have to have common mutual respect and trust. You have to also be aware of your personal behavior patterns. Everybody has crap from their past, from their childhood. Thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> Takes 18 years to screw up a person and the rest of their lives to unscrew themselves. You know, parents do their very best. Shit happens. Oh, well. You know, things happen to everybody. We all have a sad sob story from childhood. You know, it's just how and everyone has behavior patterns and things that they sometimes can't control, right? So you have to make sure that when you fall into these behavior patterns, you've got to make sure that you're not shutting down and that you are admitting your mistakes when you make them. Transparency. You have to make sure that you are not being aggressive, that you're not being passive aggressive. And if you have some serious, more deeper issues, go see a counselor on your own. Get right with yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in wanting to help yourself because that ultimately helps the relationship. And if you, as a couple, are having problems, there's nothing wrong with getting clear with a mediator. Absolutely no shame in seeing a psychologist or um, a, a psychiatrist, mostly soci- uh, not sociologist. A psychologist is good and a good enough. A marriage, family, child counselor. Usually, just find a good one. You know, find one that's on the same page as you. You don't want a counselor who is. Um, ultra conservative and and Bible thumping Christian when you're like a spiritual hippie living on a commune, having free love, right? You got to make sure that your, your therapist is absolutely along the same lines as you. Like my last therapist I went to for, um, I went for, uh, PTSD and anxiety disorders that I got from some pretty crappy things that happened to me in the past few years. So I need to get back right mentally. I want to be okay. When I do meet my love, I want to make sure that I am okay. That is my responsibility as an adult to myself, but also to my future love. Right. And it's, it's your responsibility to be mentally healthy. And it's your responsibility to be for with your partner. If they're not mentally healthy to support and love and mutually, you know, be there mutually with each other and to respect the other one. But if they're not willing to go to therapy, that could also be a deal breaker and a relationship breaker. You have to be willing to admit and everybody has vulnerabilities. Everybody has vulnerabilities and everybody has stuff from the past. We all have baggage. You can't take a trip through the journey of life without having a backpack at least everybody has baggage. So, and that's okay. There's no shame in that. We all have it. If someone says they don't have it, they're lying. And that's a baggage right there. (laughs) So, um, you have to allow for all emotions in a relationship and fights can be healthy. Fights can be healthy. They bring out the deeper issues. And I'm going to try to talk about how to have a healthy fight in future episodes or in a future episode. It's very important to know how to fight fair. What language do you use? What do you do that isn't going to inflame the situation? You don't want to put fire or you don't want to put, you know, fuel on a fire that's already starting to rage out of control, right? But it's okay to have a healthy fight once in a while. The makeup sex is amazing. (laughs) And it's, it's okay. Don't fight on purpose, you know, don't start, don't pick a fight for the makeup sex because that can be ultimately damaging. Don't poke fun, don't make fun of the other person um, if it bothers them and don't poke fun at things that are very weak links in their psyche. Don't fight unfairly. If you're going to fight, fight fair, but we're going to talk about how to do that in the future. So you always have to maintain a level of respect even during a fight. You have to maintain a level of respect. Don't resort to blaming or name calling. 
you always have to be able, you don't want to take back stuff later, right? So just talk about the issues at hand, no laundry listing, nothing from the past, but we're going to go over this later, what all this means. You have to always respect yourself, and if they start crossing boundaries and they change, you got to take a good hard look at that. Do you want to stay with someone who would be willing to not respect you suddenly? You know, or someone who suddenly isn't trustworthy. You got to be able to walk away from a relationship when it no longer serves you, especially if you've grown apart in completely different directions and it's never going to come back. Now you're in with therapy and you try the therapy, you have to be willing to walk away. But how you have a great relationship is to love, honor, respect, appreciate the other person. Never, ever, 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 ever go to bed angry. If you need to hash it out, and does that mean smoking hash? Smoking marijuana? Sometimes it does. <laughs> the same mind that created a problem isn't going to be the same mind to fix it. <laughs> I always wondered about that. Hash, hash it out? It's possible, right? All right, so if you are in a relationship and you're having a fight and you need to stay up a little bit later to hash it out, just do it. Just do it. Stay up all night, but make sure you have breakfast in the morning. Hug and kiss each other good night every night, you know? And if you're fighting, don't go to bed angry. Never go to bed angry. If you go to sleep and that person dies in their sleep, you're going to feel like crap the rest of your life, right? Don't ever go to bed angry. Always go to bed knowing in your heart of hearts you did your best today. You loved that person with all your heart today. You gave them leeway where they deserved it. And you stepped back when you needed to. And you loved and appreciated, respected and honored them all the way for the whole day. And you don't have to say to yourself, I have to do this for the rest of my life. You just have to do it for today. You have to save this for today. For today, I love you. I'm going to love you more than I did yesterday. Tomorrow, I might love you more than I did today. But all I can do is how much I love you today. And what does love mean? What are all the components of love? And this is what it is. It's honor, respect, integrity, trust. Bring your A game every day. Dress nice, smell nice, look nice, exercise for your partner. Do everything for yourself and for your partner. Love yourself first. Put your love for yourself first. Love for God first. Love for self second. Love for their partner third. Love for your kids also third. <laughs> Might be third and then your partner fourth. It depends, you know. Everyone has different priorities, but the love has got to be there. You got to love yourself first. God first, yourself second, the partner third and your kids right there on the even keel with your partner love them equally so I mean kids do come to the forefront you have kids they're number one for me 100% my kids first no no matter what (laughs) and my partner was number one for like until they came along then I'm sorry I love you very much but we got it focused on the kids and he agreed he did put the kids first also You know, and that was, that was, thank God, you know, that's, that was okay with him. So you always have to understand and remember how and why you fell in love in the first place, especially during a fight. You have to be willing to forgive yourself and the other person as well. And you always, again, you have to be willing to remember how and why you fell in love with them in the first place. You have to count your blessings every single day with this person. You know, thank God they didn't come home with heroin in their veins today. Or thank God, you know, they didn't have a gambling problem and ruin the family. Thank God she didn't have an affair on me. You know, and you don't even have to go the negative stuff. Thank God we are mutually exclusive. And I know I'm not going to die of a disease, you know, that this person brings home. Thank God we talk every day. 
We have meals together. That's important. Meals together are important. Not every meal, but make sure you have at least one meal a day together, at least, especially if you're both working. Maybe it's breakfast. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, your honey, she works the night shift and she comes home at four or five in the morning and you're just get and you have to get up at seven. Well, maybe you could get up early, have breakfast together, cuddle in bed for two hours, and then you go to work. Sometimes a lot of couples have to do that. It's a hard life, but hey, you have to have meals together, have dinner together or lunch during the day together or something. You gotta make time. Having a great relationship is based on spending time together and enjoying the time. If they get up and they go to work and you breathe a sigh of relief every day, that's a sign they're not right. If you're like, oh, thank God they're out of the house. Man, couldn't wait for that to happen. <laughs> with my first marriage, I was a little bit relieved every time he left to go to work. Even though I loved him with all my heart, he was such a good person. I was not in love with him, but I loved him. But every day when he left the house a little bit, I was like, now I got time to myself. I'm an introvert and an empath, and I love having time to myself. But with my second husband, I was like, you know what? If he left to go to the hardware store and he took an extra 20 minutes, oh my God, I missed him so much. 20 minutes apart. And we were together 24 hours a day, seven days a week usually. And when he was gone for an hour, I just, I missed him. It was so weird. I've never felt that way about any human being, (laughs) except my children, you know, maybe more so for my kids. And my um, youngest goes out for even an hour or two. I'm like, oh man. I won't text him and bother him, but after about two and a half hours, I'm like, you okay? Text him on WhatsApp real quick. You all right? (laughs) You know, but if you, that's a clue. I mean, if you, if you can't stand being away from them, you're not going to control them. You're not going to tell them not to go. You know, you're not going to force them to stay with you every single second. But if they leave for work and a little bit, you get a little bit of a pain in your heart and you're like, oh, I'm going to miss that person today. It makes it so much sweeter when when they come home. And you could be in each other's arms again and each other's uh, company and energy fields again. It's wonderful. It feels amazing. <laughs> and, it's, and then you know you have a great relationship when you can't wait to see them again, whether it's been 10 minutes or, or 10 hours. You have to be able to let things go happily every day. At the end of the day, anything that they did or said or irked you, if it wasn't really that bad. I used to get really mad at my husband for really stupid things. Like I would clean the towels and I would hang the the towels in the bathroom, you know, the the hand towels to wash your hands. And I mean, that towel would end up on the counter, on the floor, askew over to the side. It's like when people come over, I want the, the towels to look nice. You know, it's like, it's like, is that too hard to ask? Like weird things like that. And then what irritated him is if I'd wash my hands and there'd be like water on the side of the sink. That was his pet peeve. So we had these like really strange, petty pet peeves that like literally had no basis in, in, it was like, this is like so stupid. I could fix the towel in two seconds. I don't need to complain. He could fix the water on the counter. He doesn't have to complain. And after a while, we just kind of decided this is, this is stupid. Like, I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to put up with the towel being askew. I could deal with my Virgo-ness on my own. I don't need to show you the Virgo-ness, even though you know what I'm doing. (laughs) Are you fixing that damn towel again? Yes, I am. (laughs) But I was more grateful to have a husband to mess up the towel than being alone and having the towel perfect every time. But damn Skippy, now that I'm single, my towels are perfect in my bathroom every time. Every single day, I make sure my towels are straight. It's a problem. The struggle is real. (laughs) Just like when my mom told me that when she was raising my little brother, this is my birth mom, and I didn't meet her until I was 30. My, My brother was younger than me. When she got pregnant for a second time out of wedlock, she said, you know what? I don't care. I'll be a single mom this time. And she was straight. She was strong and brave and did it on her own with my brother. And But she said when he was um, little, she was like, okay, 
why do you have to keep touching the glass, the sliding glass door? She said she was always forever at the cupboards and the the refrigerator and the sliding glass door to wipe those fingerprints off, you know, make everything clean and neat, had to keep the space clean for her child. And then later she started babysitting and um, this friend of hers became like a daughter for her because she missed me and I had a mother that had given up, you know, so we both had like our adopted, you know, our adopted, um, you know, I had my adopted mom, Amber, God bless her. And, um, and then she had her, her, uh, adopted daughter that, you know, and, and so when, um, the adopted daughter got married and they had kids and, or she adopted kids and, um, she could, the little girls would come over, their little fingerprints would be on the, on the, um, they'd like lick their hands somehow and touch it to the glass. And my mom started crying one day and she said to, to her adopted daughter, she said, you know, I would rush to wash Scott's, my little brother's uh, fingerprints off the walls all the time. But now I just want to leave those little fingerprints a little while longer because they grow up so fast and it's so precious and you know what this is this is a good metaphor because same thing with marriage you know it's like the little things the petty things that bug you in the beginning it stops bothering you after a while because you grow deeper and you strengthen your love when you get you gain more um understanding of who that person is to the core of their being and you get to know them intimately on a soul level and your emotional intelligence should be growing together (laughs) as an individual and also as a couple. And when this happens, you, um, you just start to appreciate those little things. Okay. So the towel's askew and it's been askew for 20 years. You know what? That's really okay. Because at least I have that person in my life to make that towel askew, right? And now I don't have him. So what what did it matter? What did it matter? Kenny Chesney has a, um, a song, and, and one of the lyrics in the song was, why did I have to give her a, a hassle? What did it matter that she wanted to paint the bedroom yellow? That, why did that? That was such a petty little argument. And, and I think in the song, either she had died. I think that's what it was, that, that she had died. And, and what about the good stuff? Those are the good things, you know, like, so what? You have an argument. You don't like the color of the room. You could paint it next year. <laughs> you don't like modern furniture. You could get traditional or leather or wood next year. That's okay. Why not? Don't pick fights where they don't need to be. <laughs> and if you have, be willing to admit it. Be the first to admit it. Be a, be a strong woman or a strong man and go, yeah, you know what? I didn't need to start that argument. I'm sorry. Be willing to admit that you're sorry. That you, you made a mistake. Shouldn't have started an argument. Maybe it's, you're never upset for the reason you think. Remember, going back to A Course in Miracles, you're never upset for the reason you think. <laughs> And if someone's angry, you know, that's um, really just a secret band-aid over um, an underlying hurt where someone feels slighted or upset or like put upon or disrespected or for a moment they might have felt unloved, right? So make sure that you understand the other person, not only on what they're showing you at the surface, but go a little deeper, be willing to look into their soul, look into their eyes and really see you know, what, what it is about them that if they're upset, you got to understand where they're coming from. So write down a list of 10 things that you absolutely find madly irresistible about the other person. What do you absolutely love? Do they have super cute toes? Is it their laugh? Is it the way they cover their mouth when they eat? <laughs> They're afraid they might have spinach in their teeth. You know, is it, do they have little quirks? Is it the way that they dance around in their underwear in the mornings? They're so damn happy to be alive. What is it? What is it about them that makes you absolutely madly in love with them every day? 
write 10 things down about that person. And when you start to feel upset about something they're saying or doing, pull out that list and read it to yourself and see if they are still the person you want to be with. Are they still that person? Maybe they're having a bad day or a bad week or a bad month. Sometimes it's a bad year. Are you willing to go the distance with them? Ride or die. You have to find in your heart to constantly be grateful for your beloved. Be grateful that somebody puts up with your BS on your worst days. Are you worth it? Try, strive to be a better person always for yourself and for your love, your beloved. Be grateful that someone accepts you and accept them for everything they do. Do they take their shoes and socks off and throw their socks across the room and they're never going to change because they've been doing that since they were a baby? <laughs> Some people have weird habits like that, but you have to be able to live with it. If that, if you can live with it, you know, just accept them for what they are, for who they are. Acceptance is the final part of being happy, truly happy and having a great relationship. It's acceptance is hand in hand with appreciation. Absolutely goes hand in hand with appreciating the other person for who they are, what their talents are, what their ideas and thoughts and quirks are. You have to appreciate everything about them. Now, appreciating their sameness, that's easy. That's the easy stuff. Appreciating the differences, a little more challenging. But a big part of acceptance is appreciation. And all of this that I've discussed tonight, all of this is what love is all about. Love coupled with all of this is enough to have a great relationship. All right, guys, that's all I got to say about that. I will be back tomorrow with all unique programming like I am every day, seven days a week, because <laughs> I've made a commitment to you guys. And um, if you have any ideas for upcoming shows, let me know. If you want to have a reading or you have questions or comments or anything at all, let me know. <laughs> Anchor.fm forward slash forward slash metaphysical. That's how you send me a voice message. But if you want to just write me an email, that's okay too. Metaphysical soul speak at gmail.com is how you get in touch with me. And that's it, guys. I'm tired. It's three in the morning. I got this out late. Um, I want to apologize for getting it out a little on the late side. I'm already an hour and a half late. But um, I'm probably going to be two hours late, to be honest, today. Uh, I, like I said before, I try. My goal is to get it out by midnight California time. Sometimes I don't make it. I was spending some time, quality time with my son tonight, actually. And it was okay. It was good. I'm glad I got, I'm grateful for every day I get with my kid. I never know when my days are numbered. I, I don't know. I don't know if his are, you know what I mean? That's another part of this uh, love thing. You've got to always, you know, be willing to accept that this could be your last day. Live every day as if it's your last. That way you don't live with regrets. You don't create regrets later you know if you just can love and appreciate someone for who they are and where they stand today then you're going to have a great relationship all right well that's all i gotta say about that <laughs> i'm signing off <laughs> with peace and joy and the high vibes of the holy fifth dimension. Until next time, guys, peace. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. 
If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.